my coming to the High Court will be positive, will be an added advantage, and I will contribute positively to the improvement of service delivery to our people. That's very well said, um, and I hear you saying that you've learned under the tutelage of very eminent judges and that have you, you emulated them and you're ready to come to the High Court. But perhaps you could also tell us the flip side of it. Um, what is it that you know as a fact, as a judicial officer, that you would not, you would not want to emulate if you are appointed a judge from the many other judges that you've worked under? Uh, over this period that you've been working uh, in the judiciary. Thank you, my lady. The, one of the greatest challenges in the institution of the judiciary is the backlog. And I know that uh, that has been a serious concern. In my work, I have had a passion of backlog clearance, working with a, a lot of commitment to ensure that uh, we clear backlog. Uh, for example, in my last station in Machakos, I think the record from the depot will bear me out that we built a team that was able to clear backlog to very high standards. We are doing the same in Nyeri. I do not want to cut you short, but yes. there will be a time when you will be asked that question. Yes. But if you heard me, the question was simply, um, You've learned from the best, yes, and you know what is good or <clears throat> the ideals of a judge, yes. But the question was, what are what are the other vices that we would say would make a candidate not suitable for the position of a judge? Over the period that you worked in the judiciary, and of course you've been observing even your your seniors, uh, in this case the judges, your fellow judicial officers. What are some of those practices that you think we should not have in the judiciary? Uh, thank you, Judge. I think uh, one of them is non-performance, uh, failing to deliver judgments on time, rulings on time. Uh, the other one is the issue of integrity, is a concern. I know there have been a lot of issues. I think we, we need to have people who have high standard of integrity and uh, I think generally commitment to work is, has been la lacking from my experience to most of our colleagues. Thank you. That's all from me, Honorable Chief Justice. Just a few questions, uh, Your Honor. Uh, when I look at your CV, I notice that uh, you ran your own uh, law firm for approximately six years. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, before you know, transitioning to the judiciary. I would want to understand, you know, because it's not an easy decision to close your firm, personal business, and move into employment, and more so as a judicial officer. <coughs> there must have been certain considerations that you took into account that informed your decision. How could you enumerate what are those considerations? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, I did, I indeed practiced for six years. And uh, my experience then in the practice was that it was quite challenging to serve because of the situation in the judiciary at that time. It was difficult to serve clients. And uh, of course there were many challenges, matters were not moving. Uh, at that time uh, we had just had the purge. And uh, although I, I, I had joined practice uh, in myself, I, I feel and I feel strongly that I have a calling to serve in, a, in the position of a magistrate. And uh, when the position, the opportunity came, I had no hesitation. It was a challenge because uh, I know I had to get a cut from my income, but in my heart I knew that is where I wanted to be. And I, I have not regretted. Yes. Uh, very well. Now, so, which brings me to the second question. Uh, this passion that you've stated is the one that informed you to join the judiciary. Uh, what informs it? Because there must be something that there must be a key driver that you know was taking you in the direction of a judiciary. And uh, and uh, how has it been? Because you've been there now for a long time. And in answering that, which is now the three-pronged approach, what is 
What, what are the areas that you feel that you've made the greatest impact? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I believe from my very early age, I, had, I learned the, the tenets of service. And uh, throughout my life, I, 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 I feel a calling to serve. And uh, even now, when, when I look outside there, I'm serving the society, I'm serving the church. And it, and it touches me, especially when it comes to vulnerable groups. For me, I feel I have a duty to, to serve. And uh, when I looked at the practice and being on the bench, I felt at the bench I would, have, I would be more effective. I would have responsibilities that would make an impact. And uh, throughout my career, I believe that I have made a positive impact. Yes, I have contributed in uh, dispensation of justice throughout the career. And I, I believe I've served Kenyans well. And that, that is my, my commitment. That is my drive. Okay. Now, which brings me to the last two questions. When you now transition from being, from being a judicial officer to, be, to a judge, if you do become one. Now, where do you see the fundamental difference between being a J.O. and now a, a high court judge? And uh, when you speak about that difference, the fundamental difference, what is the greatest attribute that you think a good judge should have in dispensation of justice? Thank you, Commissioner. I think the one of the greatest uh, fundamental changes that would be there between being a magistrate and being a judge is that as a judge there is a greater responsibility. Uh, looking at the magistracy, most of, of our decisions are not reported. I think we, 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 they are not reported the way the High Court decisions are reported. The matters the High Court deals with are quite substantial, constitutional issues, murder cases and all these things so there is greater responsibility that will be placed on me I believe I have built the necessary capacity to manage that responsibility through my career yes there was the other angle I asked about the biggest in your estimation attribute that a good judge should have I believe a good judge should be prof highly professional should be of very high integrity standards and should be able to deliver to the people of Kenya. Yes. So my last question. The issue of independence of a judge and uh, with it uh, tell me how a judge should be able to realize that and speak a little bit about courage and whatever circumstances a judge is supposed to operate. What's your view about it that you think makes you fall in a category of a good courageous judge who will be independent regardless of whatever the circumstances that judge is operating under. Thank you, Commissioner. A judge should uh, be courageous because the work we do is uh, very sensitive, very demanding, and uh, a judge should be able to manage the court, manage the work, and be able to be to be able to be to serve the Kenyans equally, without any bias, without any other considerations, and uh, that will call a judge to be able to say no where it's necessary to say no. It requires a judge to set boundaries in all spheres of life, so that they can stand out beyond reproach. Yes. Okay, uh, taking that further, about the independence of the judiciary, which, as we all know, is uh, underpinned in the Constitution in black and white. But still, the judiciary is still very fine as not being independent. What is your view on this? Thank you, Your Ladyship. My view is that... Uh, the judiciary has come from far. Of course, there is a, a historical 
situation where the judiciary has come from and that has created a percep perception in the minds of many Kenyans that uh, the judiciary may still be in the old old practice but I believe through the years the judiciary has uh, improved in uh, its independence of course with the changes in the constitution and the setting out clear provisions on the independence of the judiciary the judiciary has made quite great strides but I believe it's work in progress because people have to change people have to build their capacities in the area of independence uh, so for you what is required is public awareness about public awareness is the independence of the judiciary yes uh, okay moving on you were also asked um, what will be the fundamental difference between being a magistrate and a judge yes and I'll ask you a question on that to what extent would you as a judge intervene in respect to arbitration proceedings I'm aware that you don't deal with that as a magistrate yes. this is a new jurisdiction yes. or a new area that uh, you would encounter if you are successful as a judge thank you my lady I, I under article 35 of the arbitration act I think there is a room for the high court to intervene I know it has been an issue in the in the super, which has gone up to the Supreme Court, the case of Newto Agrovit, and uh, I think that, that that is set out in that act how the court can intervene in the determination of a, an arbitrator. Okay. Yes. Uh, moving on, you will also encounter a new jurisdiction of interpreting. Uh, the constitution especially the validity of a statute or some provisions of a statute that may be challenged to be unconstitutional what are the guiding principles when you are determining whether a statute is uh, a constitutional the guiding principle in considering whether a statute is uh, is a uh, contravenes the constitution first is to look at the the statute and the what the constitution says and the provisions which are said to be contravened and see whether there is any contravention you also need to look at the why the act or the basis why the act is has been uh, created to see whether it aligns with the principles and objects of the constitution very well. Uh, Justice Majanja. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon once again. Good afternoon, uh, just Judge. Just one uh, question. Eh? Under the Law of Succession Act, how is the estate of a deceased polygamous man who dies interstate distributed? A deceased polygamous man, when the estate comes for distribution, the children of the deceased are, are treated equally and if there are spouses who are surviving the deceased they also get an equal portion as their children have you come across criticism of that particular provision in yes terms of uh, i know i know there are many challenges uh, in the, that area yes. where many parties feel that it should be distributed according to houses but uh, uh, according to houses but what what is the problem if you go according to houses of course that would be discriminative if there are houses with the lesser children you'd find the house has two children another one has five so if it was to go to be distributed according to the number of houses some children would be uh, disadvantaged what about the spouses a criticism about the spouses how the spouses are treated like children I think that's an issue I, I haven't uh, come across the law but I, I agree that is an issue that is uh, that is raised why, as concern why, because why, why do you think it's an issue because uh, when you look at the spouses 
they have been equal partners with the deceased. All the spouses or some of them? All of them, when, because I think because they are recognized, or the marriages are recognized. Mm. So if there are two, three spouses, they are, they are equal. What about with the, the one who came first? The one who has been with the, the man for 40 years and the one who came and <laughs> what, what happens? Yeah, I know there have been that argument, uh, whether the one who came earlier should get a larger portion, but I think uh, the law says parties in a marriage are equal. Have equal, are equal. Parties in a marriage between yes. man and wife or between man and wives? I think now that the law recognizes the <coughs> polygamy institution, uh, it would be disadvantageous uh, to say... Have you come across any decisions on that point? I, 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 I have a okay. kind of call in, yes. Okay. Now. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Lord of the CJ. Uh, Sorry. Thank you, Lord of the CJ. Uh, Honorable Willie, I have a few questions uh, related to. Uh, I've read your judgments and some of the rulings you have presented, and I think you have. Uh, you, 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 the court uh, of Sunday, a number of them. Uh, in your view, uh, how do you, the, 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 the judgments in the High Court are different from those in the Majesty Courts? Uh, do you agree with me on that line? Will yes, they be different? The, uh, the structure and the presentation? Yes, Judge, I, think they, I agree they are different. In what way? Uh, uh, I think the judges are able to go quite deep, they are able to expound the law wider than we do and uh, with, with also because of their experience of the, they have a better a better way of de delivering the judgments than the lower courts. How do you structure your judgments presently? The, the structure, body of justice, we put uh, the, the claim, if it is a civil matter, if it is a criminal matter, the, the charge, we set out the charge, we, are, we look at the evidence, analyze the evidence, then we look at the law and then set out the issues for determination, then come to the conclusion, the determination. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The, so, uh, when do you, do you, well, how do you do research and do you rely on, uh, on the president? No judgments. Yes, Judge. Yeah. I yes. saw a few which didn't have ma many presidents, authorities. But uh, I think uh, most of them I have uh, authorities. Mm. Yeah. They may not be as many, yeah. but uh, I, I, I ensure that I have looked at the law mm. as much as possible. What, as a chief magistrate, what is the area that uh, is quite prevalent where you are based now in, in Nyeri? Now in Nyeri, my lord, the area that is more prevalent is uh, succession. Yeah, that's the major area mm. that we are dealing with. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. F uh, finally, um, have you read um, judgments of? You said you have been, been mentored by senior uh, senior jurists or judges. Have you read the judgments of um, uh, people like uh, Justice uh, Madan? Sometimes back, not mm. in the recent past. Okay. Yes. Which judge uh, in, in, in the old court of appeal impressed you? The, impressed you in terms of his or her decisions? In the old court of appeal. Yeah, yes. Wow. I, I can't put a finger out in the okay. of the, of the okay. judges. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. I, I wish you all the best. Thank you, judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon once again, uh, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Commission. The last time you were here, what question did I ask you with regards to your sample writing? If you can remember. Can I recall? Because I'm, I'm usually very good, my memory is usually very good, and <laughs> among the issues that Judge Ibrahim has highlighted, we asked, I asked specifically last time, use of president in your judgment. Yes. Yeah, it's still, there's still an issue, because what you have presented quite a number don't have uh, decided cases by superior courts. Okay. Do you have anything to say about that? 
I am trying to think which one doesn't have a single reference. I, I can't. Uh -huh. There is uh, uh, Alice Mukete and Francis Nzioka. But anyway, he'll create time and go yes. through, through them. Yes. There are those that have. I know that one has. I think I'll, 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 by the time I'm done, I'll give you all the cases that do have. My because question. even this particular one, there's only one where you've just like thrown it, not really giving the context of that particular decision and why you're relying on it. But I think all of them have reference to past authorities. Maybe okay. it didn't come out very clearly, but I think all of them okay. have. So what approach do you use in deciding, in deciding cases? My approach is, uh, I think, I'm um, liberal, mm -hmm. that uh, the law is developing uh, and it, is, it speaks to the parties. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So uh, under Article 45 of the Constitution, it speaks about family. What is the difference between family and marriage? Is there a difference? The, the, the article speaks of a marriage as between a man, uh, a person and a person of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it doesn't uh, really close a marriage to those who are married because there is cohabitation, assumption of marriage. So it is, it is, it is quite, it can be... So is there a difference between marriage and a family? I would think they are, it, it could be very, very minimal. I, I can't very try to, to get the okay. difference. Well, I can't, let me, let me, I let can't me, put a date. Yes. You're, you're trying to respond to the questions that I was. So under Article 45.1, yes. the family is the natural and fundamental unit of society and the necessary basis of so social order and shall enjoy the recognition and protection of the state. That is the family. Yes. And then uh, sub article 2, every adult has the right to marry a person of the opposite gender based on the free consent of the parties. Yes. Going back to family, not marriage. What other forms of families that are outside marriage that should be protected and recognized by the state? There are families that are single parent families. Mm -hmm. There are families uh, where the parties have agreed to come together without the intention of getting married. Mm -hmm. y yes, they are families uh, of, uh, of course, they, they end up to be single parent mar marriages, families. Mm -hmm. That's where one spouse has passed on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would think of those. I was hoping you would make reference to the decision you have shared with us. Okay. The woman to yes, woman yes, marriage. The, the customary marriage and woman to woman, yes. Woman to woman marriage. Yes, yes. So that should also yes, be, recognized be. Yeah, and, uh, be recognized and protected. Yes. So about cohabitation. Last year the Supreme, Supreme Court uh, made a decision with regards to presumption of marriage. And according to the Supreme Court, presumption of marriage is on its deathbed. What are your thoughts around that particular statement? Presumption of marriage is on yes. its deathbed. Thank you, Commissioner. I, th uh, I have uh, seen that authority. I think the Supreme Court said there must be an intention so that uh, it is not just a presumption because people have been together. There must be an intention of, of marriage. So I, uh, it must be expressed. The intention must be expressed. So that would uh, actually bring a presumption to his death if parties have to express the intention that we are in this for what is the understanding marriage. by that statement that uh, presumption of marriage is on its deathbed my understanding is that it may it may not be taken as a outright family unless there is that intention expressed by the parties mm -hmm. yes and the supreme court also came up with uh, a title interdependent relationship y yes how do you differentiate between interdependent relationship and presumption of marriage according to that particular decision of the Sup supreme court my understanding commissioner is that uh, the supreme court said parties can come together and live together 
uh, have properties, mm -hmm. but without an intention of ultimately getting married or forming a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's what they recognized. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You have also mentioned when the Chief Justice asked you about uh, the issue of uh, judicial independence, you mentioned something around the workload where uh, there's, I may not be able to quote exactly what you said, but it, it focused more on there is a lot of work so people are not able to carry their weight. Is that the status? Hey. Yes, there is a lot of work mm -hmm. and uh, my view is that uh, if, if officers, all officers are committed mm -hmm. to carry their weight, it is work that is manageable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, because you have recruited over the years and we, still, we are still not hacking it. So it's not the issue of manpower. It's the issue it of efficiency. Thank you, Commissioner. It may be, there may be aspect of manpower because what has happened is that the Kenyans we are serving now are more enlightened, they are pursuing their rights. I think there are more cases coming in than before. So as we clear work, more is coming in. Okay. So there is still that aspect. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Chair. And welcome again, uh, Honorable Kebiru. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, the judiciary has been implementing a transformation agenda since 2010. You have, been, you have seen where the judiciary was before the promulgation of the Constitution 2010 to the current phase where we are implementing the social transformation through access to justice. Now, what challenges do you anticipate that may impede the realization of this journey and what possible solutions would you recommend that will help in achieving this agenda? Thank you, Commissioner. The study is a very progressive uh, program that is uh, going to and is creating a lot of change. Uh, there could be challenges and there would be challenges because, of course, to implement resources are required. I think uh, judiciary is still suffering inadequate resources and uh, that may be a challenge, one. Uh, I think the other challenge would be the need to get out and let Kenyans understand what the judiciary is doing, especially when we talk about the multi-door approach to, to dispensation of justice. That's mediation, small claims court, AJS and all that. If Kenyans don't understand and appreciate, they are, that may also be a challenge. Okay. <clears throat> so how can technology be used to improve access to justice? Thank you, Commissioner. Technology has uh, been applied in the judiciary and uh, Recently, of course, the e-filing was rolled out in the country. It's a major step that will bring great change because it brings access of justice to many people in different areas. With the ICT, we are doing virtual hearings of people in far-flung areas and even outside the country. They don't have to travel. We Issues like filing has become much easier now for litigants. They can do it from their comfort and uh, that has brought a lot of uh, improvement and change in the access to justice and improvement in the services that we deliver. Things like uh, management of resources in the, I'm thinking about IFMIS and the management of data it is making work much easier and I believe that it will go a long way in improving the dispensation of justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Yes, I was going through your documentation and I noted that you have certificates indicating that you have been trained under the auspices of the NCAJ on active case management. Yes, Commissioner. You have. 
In Faso? I am a member of the Active Case Management Committee. Great. Yes. So could you maybe share with us what are the objectives of pretrial case management in criminal cases? The objective is to improve. Give me five. Five objectives. Yes. Is to make uh, make it easier for the the court when it is uh, taking the matter to hearing, so that. Uh, before the matter goes to hearing, everything has been set on the table and parties have agreed on the way forward. That helps in uh, dispensing the justice expeditiously and it also helps the parties where we, we confirm parties have received statements or have exchanged documents. It, it reduces the issue of adjournments in uh, cases. So you ensure that parties have documents? Yes. You also ensure you've narrowed down the issues? The issues, yes. Yes, those are two. You also ensure that uh, you, under, you, you, have the, you have the picture of the case, how many witnesses, if mm -hmm. there are witnesses who may require the court's assistance to, to appear, if there are documents that may require time, like the expert documents, okay. all these issues are put on the table, mm -hmm. and uh, by the time the case starts, the court has put all these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other that you can think of? Uh, well, <laughs> I can't think of <laughs> Okay. Yes. Uh, the other area I want to engage you on is on your performance. We have your performance report from DPOP uh, for the period from 1st July 2023 to 31st December 2023. I believe you are furnished with a copy. Yes, Commissioner. And you verified that it's accurate. Yes, Commissioner. Okay, the report is good on your part, at least when it comes to the output uh, it shows you are carrying more than your weight. Uh, your contribution is expected to be 10%, but it's at 13%, which is good, especially considering you also bear the responsibility of being ahead of station, as you have told us. So uh, earlier on, my sister, Commissioner Ngutia, was engaging you, and we were discussing whether the, it's a question of numbers or a question of efficiency. Now, I'm looking at... Uh, your case clearance rate in Neri quite impressive at 116 over 104 percent when I say over I'm referring to the national average so you are well above the national average the na national average is 104 percent for all magistrates courts yes. yours is, uh, is at 116 but your court productivity is very low the national average is 299 while yours is 185 now back to the question of efficiency or efficient use of resources, if I can call it that, and numbers. What do you say about your numbers given that data? Remember, your case clearance rate is higher than the national average, but your productivity is lower. Does it tell you anything? I'm trying to relate the two. And I, I okay, you understand how you arrive at the court productivity? Yes, looking at all the, the judicial officers and each the input of each. Total number of cases that you've resolved vis-a-vis yes. -vis the number of judicial officers. Yes. And the case clearance rate? The case clearance rate is the percentage of the total number filed and total number cleared. Yes. So now, when you look at the national average, magistrates across the nation on average are handling more than you are handling in terms of court productivity yes you're getting me i get the point so but the case clearance shows you are clearing much more than most magistrates are clearing yes so what does it say about your numbers that we are i think that what you're saying that we are clearing more than what is coming in <laughs> yes, yes yes so yes. we are clearing backlog and we are clearing you are clearing, yeah. clearing more cases that means yes. in terms of distribution yes you are more than the other courts. Do you agree with me? As in, uh, in distribution of manpower. You may say that, but I think it is <laughs> because of the clearance that has reduced the numbers of the matters. The clearance is high, but yeah, the productivity the is low. <laughs> numbers would still be high. So it is the clearance as a, a correlation with the numbers. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, and I wish you well. Thank, thank you, my you. lady. Now, um, 
um, as a leader in your station, um, you are expected to ensure that the provisions of Chapter 6 continue to guide yourselves. Would you remember what um, the guiding principles of leadership and integrity are? They are quite a number. They include, uh, of course, the integrity. It includes uh, professionalism. Mm -hmm. It includes uh, uh, participation of the people in the, in the, in the management and decision making. And uh, yeah, 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 equality, uh, quite a number, mm -hmm. as per Chapter 6, yes. Okay. Um, as a leader, what would you consider yourself as transformational or what type of leadership are you offering? Commissioner, mm -hmm. I consider myself as a transformational leader. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. What are the highlights of the achievements of your transformational leadership? The highlight of my transformational leadership is uh, uh, creating teams in the stations I've headed to manage the work and deliver core business mm -hmm. and uh, and also managing the institution, the, the resources, the revenue collected, mm -hmm. the allo my amount, my resources allocated to us. I think we have, I have proved that uh, we can transform the institution. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Mwishimiwa, uh, maybe you could start by telling us um, what integrity means to you as an individual. For me, integrity, Commissioner, means working uh, above reproach, where you work without interference or influence from any quarter. Would you refer yourself as a person of integrity? And if so, why? What, what makes you think that you qualify as one? Thank you, Commissioner. I prefer myself as a person of high standard of integrity, which has been proven by my work ethics throughout my career. There has never been an issue of my compromise in issues of integrity. Have you come across a situation where your integrity has been put into test? Thank you, Commissioner. In our line of duty, it is a, it's always a, an issue where you have all manner of people who would want to access to you, maybe to get you here, to be seen with you. Please give us one, one specific incident and tell us how you went about it and perhaps any lessons that you drew from it. The one I can recall, Commissioner, is uh, where I was handling a, a matter in Machakos, and uh, I visited the Birimani court for an official purpose, and uh, a, f a, a former uh, college mate called me and uh, wanted to, to see me. And I, I insisted to know what he, he wanted to, to tell me. And uh, he mentioned about that, that matter. And I expressly told him, for matters before me, I do not, I do not meet persons on matters that are, are before me. What lessons have you drawn from that experience? And maybe any other, any other in, uh, experiences? The lessons I've learned uh, through the journey is that as a judicial officer, you have to be always on the lookout. You can never let down your guard. It is easy to, if you are not careful, to find yourself in a situation where you, you may be deemed to compromise your office. So you have always to be on the lookout and in control. How do you manage... Uh 
conflict or rejection that comes with your your strictness uh, to do the right thing you know where people want to compromise you and you stand your ground because you will not always be on the right in the right place with people because of that how do you manage thank you commissioner uh, my belief is that a choice to be a judicial officer or a judge is a calling and uh, once you have chosen that calling there are sacrifices you have to make some of them may be losing friends some of them may be losing in uh, activities that you may want to participate so it's a choice to make so it has its own consequences it has its own downs but once you choose to be on this calling you you got no choice okay yes my final question if you're successful uh, in this bid to become a judge uh, you will be leading a team and uh, you know the complexities that come with uh, managing human resource it's one of the biggest assets an institution has and uh, therefore you will be expected to, to to handle matters in a certain way so maybe you could tell us how you'd advocate for diversity and inclusivity in the institution if you're successful as a leader thank you commissioner uh, throughout the journey in this career I have managed human resource as a head of station you find yourself you are the head HR and uh, we manage diverse people from diverse backgrounds what uh, one is required is that you need to treat all people equally without any discrimination as much as you need to be empathetic understand them understand where they are coming from understand the challenges they are facing and uh, bring them build a team and my my my, my always mantra is that build a family wherever you work okay any other way other than bringing them together and uh, treating them fairly the other way i would uh, i would uh, think of is uh, of course creating opportunities where you can have the people things like team building we create time for sports where everybody participates and feels part of the of the team okay why do you think it's important to advocate for diversity i think it's a constitutional requirement <coughs> that we treat everyone equally without any discrimination and uh, we have a duty to do that wherever mm -hmm. we serve and as a manager as a manager you have a duty because the people placed under you look at you as a mentor and uh, they they expect you to guide them and i think you have a duty to do that okay yes i thought you'd mention uh, the different strengths that these diverse people bring on board yes that's thank right. you i'm satisfied thank you, thank you commissioner yes thank you but just to crown it from uh, the last question you are answering uh, a few weeks ago we woke up to a call by advocates in Yeri to go on strike because of uh, dissatisfaction with some judicial officers who are not performing uh, maybe you can tell this uh, commission uh, what role you played uh, in ensuring that um, you perform your duty properly as the end of station uh, to make sure that uh, you know the people there are properly served including the advocates thank you your leadership yes we had uh, an issue that uh, went out and uh, I want to confirm to this honorable commission that uh, Prior to that, uh, that day when the issue went out, we had met with the local LSK executive several times on the issues and we had addressed them. We, of course, we had not uh, gotten the solutions we were working on. 
when the, the, the matter came out, I talked to the chairman of the RSK and uh, he, he had his issues. He told me the, the issues had gotten out of his hand because uh, I think there were, it was time for the LSK politics and uh, the, the, there were some advocates who took advantage of it. But we managed the situations. We were able to organize an urgent meeting very early that uh, Monday morning. We gathered the advocates and they were kind enough to come. We had a long talk. I'm glad the Court of Appeal judges uh, were represented and the High Court and we came up with resolutions which we are working on. Of course there, were, there was a, a, a lack of communication on certain areas which were affecting our judicial officers and when we did communicate the advocates understood and they have, we have agreed on a formula to improve services to our people. So you successfully brought calm in the station? Yes, we are very calm now okay. and very happy. I hope it will continue like that. It will, Chief Justice. Yes, I think this brings us to the end of the interview. Thank you uh, for your time. It's been an engaging time with the commissioners. I wish you well. But before we release you, we always give the candidate an opportunity to ask us a question or tell us something. Thank you, Your Leadership. I do not have a question to the Commission. I just wish to thank the Commission for the opportunity to appear again. And uh, I learn a lot from this engagement and I hope it will help me to be a better servant for our people. Thank you very much. We wish you well. We will be in communication when the exercise is completed. All the best. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Judge. Yes. Thank you. You are released.